Sometimes in nature, animals defy instinct and form unusual bonds. Meet a faithful pup who stands by her handicapped best friend. Join a Hawaiian local and his surfing pig. Ah, right there, boy. <laughs> and witness a dog that's friends with a rat. Whatever their size, shape, or species, these incredible duos have all become unlikely animal friends. It's said that there's no place where the sun shines quite like it does in Central Florida. This suits the four-legged customers at Jacqueline Borum's Pet Spa just fine. We do boarding, grooming, retail, daycare, but the adoption part of it is uh, really where our heart is at. At the center of it all is Jacqueline's pint-sized pooch, Iggy, who soaks up all the treats and belly rubs she can find. Iggy is a big dog in a small dog body, <laughs> pretty much. She's fearless. Anyone that's ever had a dachshund or known a dachshund know that they take that protective instinct uh, to the next level. Come on. More than anything, Iggy's most protective over her best friend, a spirited feline named Ruth. Ruth and Iggy are pretty much with each other 24-7. And Iggy stands in the gap between Ruth and any other animal that may be coming by in the daytime. It's, it's pretty impressive. Ruth and her fearless protector weren't always living in the lap of luxury. Ruth and Iggy were abandoned at the end of someone's driveway in Geneva, Florida, and Iggy was covered in ants, protecting her cat, and stood by her best buddy. Ruth was born with a genetic defect, but more than that, she has a problem with chronic anemia. Ruth's birth defect is neurological and muscular. It prevents her from walking. Her body also attacks her own red blood cells, making her weak. Iggy stayed with her helpless friend until they were rescued. When they went to animal services, it's common practice to separate the cats from the dogs. They quickly realized that Ruthie had some disability and they didn't do well being apart. So after three days, when they finally did reunite them, it was clear that they really needed to stay together. And that's when they reached out to us. Now settled in at the spa, Iggy still keeps a watchful eye over Ruth. Iggy's very in tune to Ruth's limitations, and she's there to protect her no matter what. Dachshunds like Iggy are known to be a protective breed, and there's a good chance that she would have had to protect Ruth from dangers while they were abandoned. And when animals go through extreme conditions together, it's really no surprise that they form a really strong bond. Ruth and Iggy show a mutual admiration for one another, and they show it every day, just the way they interact. They snuggle and sleep together. They share the toys together. Since being rescued, Ruth and Iggy's story has captured the attention of the national media. I think people are touched by their story because there's such a pure honesty about that friendship that there's, there's no motives, there's no agenda. It's just pure love at, at its simplest and its finest. These days, Ruth has a packed calendar thanks to a slew of ongoing vet appointments and medical treatments. Ruth's health is closely monitored. So we do have her evaluated every couple of weeks uh, to make sure that she is in optimum health. And of course, Iggy goes with wherever Ruthie goes. And uh, it's pretty cute. Dr. Aaron Holder has been Ruth and Iggy's primary veterinarian ever since Jacqueline adopted them. I first saw Ruthie a few months ago. She seemed to be getting weaker and Jackie was concerned about that. And so I got to meet both Ruth and Iggy. And here's our little treasure. Hi, Miss Ruth. 
All right, how's she been doing? She's been doing real good. While Ruth runs the gamut of blood tests and therapy treatments, Iggy loyally stands by her favorite feline friend. Good there time. it is, Ruthie. Good girl. It's quite evident their bond is something special from the minute they came in. Iggy is watching over Ruth. She's protective. Um, she's most comfortable when she can be near Ruthie. Ruth seems to be doing great. Um, she, her appetite is great, energy level is good, and so we're gonna run a blood test to see um, exactly how she's doing as far as her red blood cell count. Since Ruthie's been diagnosed with her anemia, we are consistently checking her red blood cells and her levels dropped there for a while when we tried to wean her down from her medication, but now they're bouncing back up and she seems to be quite stable. All right, good girl. Next up, acupuncture. Acupuncture in general can be used for almost any condition. I'm using acupuncture with Ruthie to balance her immune system and to decrease the muscle spasms. I'm hoping to help communicate the brain to the legs a little bit better. This one's not her favorite. Let's see how you do. Oh, what a good girl. While Ruth receives her deep needle treatment, she looks to her devoted friend for support. You okay? Ruthie is nestling into Iggy because I think she knows that she's her protector. And uh, this is her little source of comfort here. And I think she draws strength from Iggy. It's just touching how much they love each other. It's common for animals that are closely socially bonded to offer each other care and comfort. And you can see how Ruth seeks Iggy out for that soothing interaction when she's frightened. Iggy is her rock and she's happy to be there for her. Last but not least, Ruth receives some physical therapy to finish off her checkup. So what we're doing with Ruthie is we're trying to build her muscles back up from her condition. So we're using different techniques of physical therapy in order to strengthen her muscles and keep her nice and flexible. Being able to incorporate uh, physical therapy with Ruthie is critical for her muscles. It will help maintain muscle mass. It will help her potentially get a little bit more muscle mass, maybe get a little bit stronger. And that's what we're all daring to hope. For this patient, the number one prescription is a healthy dose of hope. Call me optimistic, but my goal is to try and help her move around better. It's always to keep them free of pain, which we don't feel that Ruthie is in any pain, but we want to potentially maybe see if she can walk. Now that Ruth's had her checkup, it's Iggy's turn to hit the scales for her monthly weigh-in. When we go to Ruthie's vet appointment, Iggy gets on the scale too. And sometimes that's a good day and sometimes that's a not so good day. All right, be still. One second. Think thin. Moment of truth. Moment of truth. Yay, 12.6. 12.6, we're down. Over 50% of the dogs in the US are overweight. And just like with people, that can mean health issues. Iggy herself needs to lose a little bit of weight, probably around a pound. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but if you think about it, that's almost 10% of her body weight. So we do try to monitor Iggy's food. She likes to uh, be the official taste tester for whatever Ruth's having. From sharing food to a bed, it's a one-of-a-kind friendship that proves all you need is a buddy to rest your head on. I don't think I've seen such a close bond between animals, but I am lucky to be in my field and see amazing animal stories all the time. But this, this is unique. Ruth and Iggy are the face of abandoned and unwanted animals, and it really gives hope to all things are possible. Dreams really do come true. Oahu, Hawaii. A tropical paradise in the middle of the Pacific. It's considered the birthplace of big wave surfing. Here, avid surfer Kai Holt even dreams of riding waves, together with his unlikely friend. 
Hey, come on. Good morning, sunshine. Karma, the pig. Oh, it's late. Sun is high. Right, you ready for the beach? Let's get some fresh fruit for breakfast. Surf, eat, sleep, repeat. Kama's my body pillow now. He used to be my pillow. Now he's my body pillow. <laughs> when they sleep together, he hogs a bed. He's a, he's a bed hog. Ooh, another beautiful day in Hawaii, ne? Oh, looks like there's a little bit of swell from the north. Small bump from the south, slight trades. Oh, we might get some today, boy. <laughs> Kai met Kama on a camping trip. Kama just came walking into the campsite. Like, hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Kama, here I am. So we picked him up and we took him home and just raised him like a kid. Kai named his adopted son, Kama Pua'a, after the Hawaiian pig god. In short, Kama. I don't know where he comes from, but he's here now. And he ain't going nowhere. He's, he's here to stay. Kama's more like a son. Come on, come. Everything I do, he does it with me. We're pretty inseparable. As Kai's constant companion, Kama joined him to the beach. The saying is, when pigs fly. Ah, right there, boy. But can they surf? <laughs> It didn't take long for Kai to take his pig to check out the surf. Oh, look at that. He can't even wait to get in the water. Boy, you gotta wait till we get in the water. When Kama started surfing, he was about a month old. Kama would always follow me out when I'm about, you know, about to go surf. He'd jump in, swim in while I'm jumping in, paddling out. I'm like, oh, wait, you gonna come out? So I'd throw him on my board. I paddled out with him. That's a baby. We got out to the, to the lineup turned around and started surfing. He was on the, he ran straight to the nose. <laughs> Just like, wee, 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 right in the nose, all the way to shore. And from the first day on, we went 30 days straight. Quickly, this little piggy was known as Kama, the surfing pig. Kama's stocky build helped him stay steady on the board, but some swells were too powerful even for this wine. For the first time we ever wiped out, we hit a chop and the board bounced up and he went flying, whee, splash into the water. Just started swimming right back to the board like, like he's having fun and he wants more. I was like, oh, yeah, Kawa, hi, hooves. From that moment on, I knew he was hooked. As you can imagine, most pigs have a good percentage of body fat, which helps keep them buoyant in the water. They're also great kickers, and that helps them swim pretty fast. In sync with each other, these two surfed like a father-son acrobatic team. It's a challenge. It's like a tandem surfing ballet act where we have to counterbalance each other. Kama runs all over the board. So if he goes up, I gotta go back just to keep us from nose diving, you know? If he comes back, I gotta move up to keep us level. <laughs> what sets Kama apart from the rest of the surfers is that when you're surfing with your best friend, you know, that's having a blast, you're, you're like sharing happiness together. It's actually taking surfing to some different type of level. Eight months later, at over 100 pounds, Kama's outgrown Kai's longboards. He's already broken five. Kama's weight is a, is a huge factor now in, in our surfing. I mean, he's getting better as, an, as a surfer, you know, experience-wise. He's got a lot of experience under his belt. Kama's a beast, man. He's a board-breaking beast. His hooves just ripped it right open. Brand spanking new board. Time for another one. <laughs> yeah, this one lasted us a day. Not bad. Board a month, 
Looks like he's down to a board a day. <laughs> we need an indestructible board. Pig proof. Breakfast of champs. Fresh from the trees. Like any pig, Kama loves to eat. Ah, right there, boy. This is a good one. Let's see if we can get that. All right. Fresh avocados. Fresh as it gets. This morning's breakfast comes right from the source. Oh, yeah, so Kama's a vegan. All vegetables, fruits. We got some papaya here. Like that? Oh, you're going to lay in it, huh? Only the best for the boy, huh? 8.30 in the morning, and it's already 80 degrees. So Kai makes sure Kama stays cool. Pigs, they don't sweat, so they overheat. Cool it down. Pigs like Kama only have a few sweat glands, and it's not enough to keep their body cool. Instead, what pigs do is something called behavioral thermoregulation, which just means that they like to roll in the mud. The mud coats their body, and it helps keep their body temperature cool. Now we're done with breakfast. We gotta brush our teeth. Let's brush our teeth. Come on. Come on. There you go, get that. Put that back there. We share the same toothbrush. <laughs> nah, this is yours now. Let me smell your breath. <laughs> oh, nice and fresh. All right, you ready for the day? Today, Kai plans to launch an outrigger canoe for Kama, called a va'a in Hawaiian. This one was hand-built by Kai, his family, and friends. Making the canoe is, is a part of life. It's a part of our culture and history here. That's how the ancients got here. They sailed on Pacific Island voyaging canoes, and they brought pigs with them. That's how Kama's ancestors got here, too. One, two, three, hip. It took about three months off and on to build the canoe. It's a big part of the Hawaiian culture. Everybody came to help. There was a lot of uh, community efforts to help build the canoe for Kamu, so it would be a success. Raiden, let's go. We're going to the beach, hurry up. Guess who sits in the front seat with Kai? Good boy, right on. Kai's son sits in the back, and then uncle sits in the back. All right, boy, all aboard the Kama train. Woo hoo, let's go. Let's go. Just like he was standing up giving Kai directions on how to get to the beach. <laughs> it's very unusual for a man to have a pig as a friend. Everywhere Kai goes, Kama the surfing pig is with him. 24-7, never fails. Whatever beach we're at, they're together. They're best friends. Now, Kama's handmade canoe gets a traditional Hawaiian send-off. Come boys, Kama canoe. Kama canoe. A group of children from a nearby school bless the vessel's maiden voyage. The ceremony right now we're having is to bless Kama's canoe, which is uh, very important because it's giving back to, you know, what we get. This tree that we harvested from the forest, which had a spirit in it, we give thanks and praise to it. And uh, now it's incarnated into a living vessel that can sail the sea. Yeah, Kamo's having a blast. Yeah, he's loving it. He's hamming it up out there. Yeah, he had a great time. All right, boy, that was a good session. Ooh, you must be hungry. Ready to eat? Uh, eat, drink, and be merry? All right, party time. <laughs> Come on, how's the surf? That's all right. All right, cooking up some stuff Ooh, for you over so here. Good. Some Check of it out, Kama. How about some of this eggplant? Yeah, go for it, man. Fresh as it gets, right out the garden. In honor of Kama and the canoe's successful first launch, Kai meets friends and family for a party. He does it a little differently than most people with their pets. 
Sometimes it just seems like Kama is a part of Kai, not just his pig or his friend. This unlikely duo celebrates life, love, and their special friendship, Hawaiian freestyle. When Kai is playing music, Kama is right in the front, leading everybody in the singing and in the dancing. And don't kid yourself, Kama knows how to dance. Kama is like heaven sent. It's part of the family now. You know, I can't imagine uh, the world without him. Opposites may attract, but this size difference pushes the limits. A dog who's best friends with a rat. Upstate New York in autumn is a magical place for all creatures. Come on, come on. Here, artist Christopher Durham lives with his four-legged friends, including his coon hound, Cooper. Are you looking for squirrels? Cooper is my latest addition to the family. He is a coon hound that was given to me six months ago. He is the biggest love bug I have ever seen. There you go. Christopher's also a licensed animal rehabilitator, nursing injured wildlife back to health. Okay, I think he's clean enough. You like everything, don't you? Cooper's friendly with all of his housemates, but he's especially fond of one female, a rat named Olivia. Olivia really, really took to him, and he is crazy about her. He'll start licking her, caressing her, and she'll get under his paws. Olivia arrived on this farm three years ago when she was just six weeks old. Olivia is smart, curious, incredibly affectionate, really wants to be wherever the party is. I get up in the morning and let her out when I let the dogs out, and she runs around the house. While Olivia's got the run of the entire place, she usually hides in her favorite spot, next to or under her unlikely friend. Cooper has had four homes, and I have promised him I will be his last permanent home. Come on, bud. Hey, sweetie. Guess he wants to say hi. Olivia bonded with Cooper soon after he moved in. They've been best friends ever since. I had Olivia in my hands. I got on my knees, and I called Cooper over. And I was so surprised because he's a hunting dog. I didn't think he'd bite her, but he just started licking her all over. And then ultimately I put her on the ground. I didn't know if he'd pounce. And then interestingly, she started following behind him and this bond formed. Rats have been around for millions of years and many species are social and live in colonies. So it's really no surprise that Olivia would try to bond with another animal. What's really weird though, is that Cooper is a coon hound and they're known for hunting small animals. With an amazingly strong sense of smell, Cooper always knows where his smaller sidekick is. Come on, let's go. Most of the time, she'll follow behind him, and then if she goes off to explore, he wants to know where she is. And with his nose, I always know where she is because I say, where's the rat? And he'll let me know. Where's the rat? Cooper, where's the rat? Olivia also helps with some of Cooper's training. Come on. Cooper, because he's young, two and a half years old, he's a bouncy dog. Coop, come here. All right, I want you to sit. Sit. No, sit. Sometimes I'll take Olivia out when I want him to calm down. <laughs> he's a little wound up. And for some reason, she has a very calming effect. Other times, these two simply enjoy a game of hide and seek. Cooper, where is she? Where is she? Find her. Olivia, being a rodent, is a burrower. It's for safety. They like to go under burrow in the grass or the leaves or under a, a blanket. Where did she go? The funny thing is that Cooper wants to play with her and be with her, so she's always burrowing under. He's always digging her out. As adorable as Olivia is, 
Rats can have a bad reputation. Rats are considered by the public to be dirty. I know because I work in New York City, you know, we see the subway rats, and they're incredibly clean. I don't know any animal except a cat that grooms itself more. Rats get a bad rap. They're regarded as dirty animals, but they are not. They make great pets. They're clean and fun and affectionate, and they fit right in your pocket so you can take them everywhere. Whether indoors or outdoors, this duo frolics around for most of the day. When I watch Olivia and Cooper together, I kind of forget he's a dog and I forget she's a rat because you're really just watching two animals that really just seem to enjoy each other's company. I really think they're happy together more than when they're apart. Inspired by his surrounding muses, Christopher has turned his passion for animals into art. I've been a pet portrait artist for now about eight years. I've been painting my entire life, but I really found a niche. People love their pets, and they commission me all the time. His next subjects are close to his heart. Stay, stay right there. Good. I'm doing a portrait of Cooper and Olivia, and it'll just represent the friendship between those two. Getting a rat and a dog to stay still poses its challenges. Hold on, stay. When people see Cooper and Olivia playing together, it's usually bewilderment, but then they just laugh. I think those two bring so much joy because people don't expect it. At the end of the day, despite their size difference, these unlikely friends are a perfect fit. I don't really think they have many differences. I think that's kind of the beauty of it. I just think it's part of the wonderful magicalness of the animal world but they're just very sweet and trusting, and they're just both very gentle creatures, and I guess that's why they kind of bond. Next, you've heard of guide dogs, but what about a guide horse? Corey, good girl. Just north of downtown Lansing, Michigan, the city gives way to rolling hills and plains. Hey guys, good morning. How are those bunny rabbits? Are we friends? Mona Ramuni lives here with her husband, Randy, and a few pets. Every day, Mona heads to the backyard to visit her most trusted companion. Morning, girls. Callie. A miniature horse named Callie. Oh. Come here, Mama. How's my Mama? Come here, sweetie. Come on. I have been blind since birth. Callie is my wonderful, amazing guide horse. There's no word that I can think of that can describe our bond. When she's doing her job, she is trying to protect me, and I am trying to protect her, and I am always mindful of how much love there is between us. My girl. Who's my girl? Kia's my girl. Forward. In a country with around 10,000 guide dogs, Kelly may not seem like the obvious choice as a seeing eye animal. There are many reasons that I personally chose a horse instead of a dog. I grew up Muslim. In Islam, dog saliva is considered unclean. Out of respect for my parents, who are not animal people and would not have wanted a dog in their home, I chose to get a guide horse. Good girl, my love. Kelly also has other qualities that make her an ideal set of eyes for Mona. First of all, the longer lifespan. Miniature horses can live 30 to 40 years. Horses' vision is quite a bit better in some respects. Horses' eyes are set on the side of their heads, giving them about a 350-degree field of vision. That allows them to see a lot of potential dangers. Also, they have wonderful memories. These two characteristics make horses like Callie great guide pets. Good girl. Mona and Callie have been together for six years. Today, these unlikely friends are a fine-tuned team. Callie was trained to do the things that a guide dog does. 
stop at curbs, find chairs, doors, elevator buttons, all the kinds of things that guide dogs do. This means Callie can guide Mona everywhere. I can take Callie on buses, trains, into hotels, into restaurants, movie theaters, malls. Anywhere that I can go, she can go. Even up in the air. When I'm on a plane with Callie, we sit in bulkhead, so she has plenty of room. I gave her some ice chips to chew on so that her ears would pop so that it wouldn't hurt. And she was just such a good sport. Today, Mona and Callie head into town. I know. You gotta bear with me. You know how I am, Cal. Good girl. Good job. Yeah. Dad and Mama. Forward. Good girl. Step. There's one last thing to take care of before they leave. Step. Good girl. Step. Callie is potty trained so that when she goes into public places, we know we won't have any accidents. Cal, get busy. Get busy, cow, cow, try again. We're relieving harnesses so that when I ask her to get busy, she will go potty and it will go into her, this plastic bag so that I don't have to pick it up. Forward. Good girl, forward. Good girl. Mona and Callie are regulars on Lansing's bus system. One of the biggest challenges for me, being blind, and I think for most blind people, is transportation. Good girl, Cal. Find the curb. Find the curb, Cal. Hi. Hi, Cal. Find a step, Cal. Good girl. Good girl. Come on, I need your help. Good girl. Good girl. Turn around. Go right. Go right. Find a chair, Cal. Find. Find a chair. Find. Good girl. Cool girl. I think it's great to have a horse on the bus. Um, we got a lot of service dogs. Miniature horses are bred to be no more than 38 inches tall. Traditional horses, depending on the breed, can be anywhere from 56 to 72 inches tall. That makes Cali perfect for bringing on public transportation. When Mona's out with Cali, Cali's working and Mona's actually trying to get on with her life. But very often it's like she's a rock star. It doesn't take long for onlookers to approach Mona and Callie. She feels that she's a PR person for miniature horses, a service animal, so she takes that time to make sure that people understand and feel comfortable. When you were touching her, she was telling me that you were touching her, okay? If I put my hand on her, she would nudge you to show me that you're touching her. Yep, do you see that? What is it, Cal? Show me. Who is it? Who is it? With show and tell over, it's time to get back to work. Good girl, Cal. Forward. Having Callie by her side is second nature for Mona. But how will others react to a horse in a supermarket? Hi. Mona Ramuni takes the attention over her guide horse, Callie, in stride. I'm Mona, and I'm, you are? I'm Beryl. It's nice to meet you, Beryl. Good to meet you, too. Good girl, Kelly. Now, what kind of groceries are we looking for? I want some apples. Apples. I want some cheese. Okay. And potato chips. Okay. Kelly is indeed very special. It would be hard to find a service animal with her character and quality. She also really sees Mona as part of her herd and that she's gonna take care of her. Callie would give her life for Mona. I would bet money on it. Good girl. Yeah. What, my love? What? What is it? Are we friends? We are best friends. Mona definitely talks to Callie a lot, and she talks to her in different ways with different tones. And I'll tell you something, Callie listens. You know, it's almost like there's a little person in Callie. Whoa, well, Stan, I know beautiful. Oh, you're fine. Thank you so much, Beryl. You're so welcome. I really appreciate it. It was a pleasure to shop with you today. Forward. Forward. Find the door. 
After their trip to the grocery store, Mona and Callie make their way to meet Randy for lunch. Forward, what you got? How are you doing today, ma'am? I'm fine, thank you. How are you? I take Callie out with me to restaurants very often. Find Randy, Kale. She loves it. She loves to work. How was she today? She was wonderful. She's, she's almost always wonderful. You know, she's good. She's a pro. Some people are really thrilled to have her. Other people are not. Because it's a, an establishment where people eat, um, some people complain. I've had people even get up and walk out of the restaurant. And I honestly don't feel too bad about that because my horse is very clean. She's very well-mannered. How are you doing today, folks? Good. 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 Thank you. Guide dogs have been helping people since the mid-16th century. As of today, only miniature horses and dogs are ADA-approved guide animals. Miniature horses were added to the list in 2011. Mona's happy that she chose Callie, one of the few guide horses in the country. Okay, just, just chill out for a minute, girl. Callie has changed my life so much that I would like to pass on what I have gained from her to other people. Good girl, find the curb. Inspired by Callie, Mona's on a mission. 20 years from now, I hope to see that guide horses and service horses will become more numerous. My passion is training these horses for people with all sorts of disabilities. I always say everyone who wants one should have their own Cali. Before they head home, Mona and Cali take a stroll through East Lansing. Having a service animal is much more than having a pet. It's a much deeper bond because you're completely trusting your life to this horse. If Callie had wanted to today, she could have walked me into the middle of the street and stopped and let me get hit by a car. I mean, what does it matter to her? But it matters to her and she's protecting me. Whereas, you know, my bunny is not really gonna care as long as I feed it dinner. This partnership shows how deep a bond can be between two uncommon companions. Girl. The relationship between Callie and Mona, it's powerful. There's, there's a kind of intimacy that they have that uh, nobody else shares. Callie and I have a symbiotic relationship. She is my partner. Hey! The ride has arrived. Yay! Callie has saved my life numerous times. Callie watches out for me, protects me, helps me. She is always there for me. John? I hope Good so. Good girl. Got her? Callie has changed my life because before Callie, I had no independence. She opened up the whole world for me. Callie is my heart. That's the only way I can describe it. Where's the curb? Good girl. This man filmed an event never captured on camera before. Watch what happens when a dolphin tries to befriend a pod of sperm whales. The Azores. A group of volcanic islands 900 miles off the coast of mainland Portugal. The waters surrounding these islands are one of the most concentrated sperm whale breeding grounds on the planet. The Azores is actually a unique area to conduct research. It's a very uniquely beautiful place, but it also has uh, a large, a very high density of sperm whales and their family groups. In 2011, behavioral ecologist Dr. Alexander Wilson was part of a team of scientists trailing a pod of adult females and calves. We've been traveling for several hours that morning. It was a nice sunny day, uh, perfect weather for the Azores, and we uh, happened to come across a sperm whale group. Alexander dives into the water to get a close-up view of the sperm whales. Then he sees something unusual that catches his attention. Amongst the pod of traveling sperm whales is a bottlenose dolphin. We took a second to figure out what exactly was happening. The fact that this dolphin was interacting with these whales and they're swimming around together and touching each other, it was all quite extraordinary. 
Fortunately, Alexander was able to capture it all on camera. What's even more remarkable is that this creature is not your typical dolphin. He has a spinal malformation known as scoliosis. In general, in nature, whenever you have a very obvious deformity like this dolphin had in terms of its scoliosis, it's very unlikely that these animals can escape predation and survive to adulthood. Despite his impairment, the dolphin playfully interacts with the whales. He nuzzles their bellies, sides, and dorsal fins. The whales even reciprocate some of this behavior. There's no evidence uh, in the historical record of this ever happening with any other species. And the fact that the sperm whales were interacting with this bottlenose dolphin as if it were a member of the group and treating it as such um, is completely unknown from a scientific standpoint. It's never been seen before. This unlikely friendship is all the more surprising because sperm whales have never been known to associate with any other whales let alone dolphins. Sperm whales in general tend to shy away from social contact, both with people as well as other species. Um, and so they've basically developed a reputation for being more timid than other species. Bottlenose dolphins aren't all friendly. They're known to be aggressive towards other sea creatures. Ecologists have seen dolphins attacking sperm whale calves in the area. The dolphins are, in fact, harassing the calves rather than uh, interacting in a friendly way or in a curious way. It's usually a, a, in an antagonistic way. But this dolphin only has nuzzles for his whale friends. He even gently rubs one of the calves with his snout. The dolphin's impairment may be the reason why he's with the sperm whales. In fact, his own kind might have abandoned him. Dolphins exhibit a very strong dominance hierarchy uh, at times, and perhaps this dolphin was harassed given its body shape. Perhaps it couldn't keep up, perhaps it just was being picked on, we're not sure. Luckily, the whales have taken this dolphin under their fins. One reason for this adoptive behavior could be mistaken identity. The fact that this dolphin being around three meters in length and so very similarly sized to a sperm whale calf, it was mistaken for being a calf. The whales could also be nurturing the impaired creature. Sperm whales definitely are known to look after injured or, or sick members of their social groups. So it's possible that for whatever reason that this dolphin um, looked like it required attention or um, was behaved very similarly to a sperm whale calf. The fact that whale calves are present with this pod may also allow the dolphin to hang with the group. Adult sperm whales are amazing hunters. They can dive as deep as 6,600 feet down, hunting for octopus and squid. While they're diving, the baby sperm whales stay with the dolphin, and the dolphins afforded that protection of being with a group. The dolphin might also use his whale friends as providers of food, including deep sea squid. One theory for why this interaction might be occurring is that the uh, dolphin is foraging on these little bits of food that are left over from the sperm whales from their eating or regurgitation. Whatever the case for this unlikely friendship, it's been a highlight of Alexander's firsthand experiences at the Azores Islands. Swimming with whales is always an exciting experience. And to be able to see this dolphin interacting with these whales it was a, a wonderful opportunity that probably is a once in a lifetime chance. For your moonlighting astronomers with out of this world dreams, fuel their curiosity with Nat Geo Kids.